Uh, hello, and uh, welcome to the beautiful Empire Room. Um, thank you for uh, coming to the conference and supporting the Midwest Political Science Association. Uh, today, we're, uh, you're coming to one of the Empire Series lectures, which is a new idea in this, in this organization. Uh, the idea is to create a space, to create a, a place to really see a great presentation, uh, to engage a speaker, and to think about uh, some ideas. So at the end, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you think about it and whether you want the Midwest Political Science Association to do more of this type of thing. Um, my name is Arthur Lupia, and I'm the president of the MPSA. It's my great pleasure today to introduce to you our, our Empire Series speaker, Patrick Regan. Uh, Patrick Regan is a professor of peace studies and political science at the University of Notre Dame. He has a PhD from the University of Michigan. He has published three books, each on various aspects of armed conflict, particularly civil wars, and he has published over 40 articles in political science journals, mostly on aspects of resolving armed conflict, and again, primarily about doing so in civil wars. He is the immediate past president of the Peace Science Society and has a forthcoming book on the global politics of climate change, which is the topic of today's talk. Climate change, uh, I'm sorry, the global politics of climate change. It's my great privilege to introduce to you Patrick Regan. Okay, th thanks, Skip. Um, I'm going to do this. I came back from the ISA meetings with one heck of a cold. Um, and so I'm going to manage this talk through eating halls. I have a pocket full of halls and a little bit of water, um, and we'll just work that out. Uh, when I was asked to do this, I asked what the parameters for the talk were, and this was the answer that I got. Make it, make it accessible, engaging, and profound. Um, I'm not certain those aren't mutually exclusive categories, but I'm going to try. I was also nearly certain that when I was asked, I was asked to talk about civil wars because that's what most of my work was on. And that seemed like too simple of a task for me, so I'm going to talk about climate change. Um, and it is because I'm doing work on climate change. I'm going to tell you how I got to this point. Um, I'm just in the final stages of finishing a book on climate change, and the, the, the story I'm going to tell you today comes from uh, thinking about climate change and conflict. And this has very little to do with climate change and conflict. But I'll tell you how I got there and, and then how I see some of the difficulties we face with uh, dealing with climate change. Um, there are the links there. I puzzle when I think about climate change because we are arguably, and it might be an argument, um, the most intelligent being on the planet. And some foresee extinction in the horizon. And the, the most recent UN report kind of tells us that. And we do next to nothing. And I thought what the trilobites and the dinosaurs would do if they had that opportunity and they could pull this off. If the dinosaurs saw the meteorite coming, would they just sit there and look at it? Um, it seems to me that that's what we're doing. And so it, it uh, is a topic we're talking about. Here's the puzzle. I started teaching a course that had an element of climate change in it, and I was going to link it to conflict. And we hired a new president in January of 2009 who ran on the notion of change and yes, we can and all that good stuff. He was going to go green and save the planet, so there were green jobs. This all seemed great. January of 2009, we swore in a new Congress. And some will say that we swore at the new Congress, and I might be one of them. But it had an overwhelming majority in the Democratic Party. And they, in their wisdom, passed the Clean Air and Energy Air and Security Act, H.R. 2454. This is what I'm reading as I'm developing this puzzle here. Uh, it mandates a reduction in CO2 emissions by 18% by the year 2020, so a decade down the track. There's a Democratic majority of 75 votes, and it passes by seven votes. So it's a squeaker. And I thought to myself, well, why wouldn't that be a 75 vote majority uh, margin in, in the House on this act? Um, the president's party had a 59 vote uh, majority in the Senate. Nearly at that time, um, um, uh, filibuster proof, and pretty close to ratification of a, a, enough votes to ratify a treaty. So it didn't make any sense to me that he would run off to Copenhagen, where everybody uh, thought that we would get a 50% reduction. And at some level, the president had pre-approval for 18%. So to my mind, you have international leaders calling for a 50% reduction. 
the scientific community and advocates saying we must reduce by 50% if we ha want to have a chance of doing this. And we have pre-approval for 18% and we come back with nothing. So I asked myself, how in the world did we not come back with at least an 18% treaty? A treaty that mandated reductions by 18% because this is something Obama probably could have got ratified even though it was insufficient relative to the world community. How'd that happen? So I switched, I got off the conflict part of it for my class and we dealt with this. You know, how, how's this happen? Many people will explain this by the Chinese being uncooperative and the Brazilians and the developing countries and not being able to figure out how to fund the developing world's uh, modifications. Um, and then what we came back with was a commitment to hold global temperature increase to two degrees Celsius. Now, uh, if, you're, if you're worried, if you think that you can hold it to two degrees Celsius, then you must be expecting, if we do nothing, that it goes higher than two degrees uh, Celsius. So two degrees is like the, the high water mark that we can't go past in their mind. So it's worthwhile thinking about what two degrees means. Okay? It's a global uh, average. And if you look at NOAA data, um, in, you plot, you can get the data from 1880 to 2012 and plot it by latitude. And it looks like a, a uh, hourglass. So at the poles, the, the uh, temperature anomalies are considerably greater than they are at the equator. And the whole hourglass is shoved up closer to uh, zero, to the baseline that they calculate. So there are many times, in many instances, where the temperature is cooler. Most of the time, they're, they're warmer. Um, but it's not distributed equally across the planet. Okay? Uh, I think most climate science uh, hydrologists, ecologists, biologists um, will tell us that two degrees warmer is not good for the planet. Um, if you look at historical data, um, we're approaching periods both with CO2 concentrations that you have to go back millions of years to find CO2 concentrations that approximate where we are. And uh, we're, we're not far from, from broaching the world of the dinosaurs that saw the asteroid coming and forgot to duck. Um, so um, I'm going to ask just what it gets us. If we get to two, two degrees, we got it made. In the last century, roughly, we've increased about one degree Celsius. It's roughly two degrees, 1.8 degrees uh, centigrade. You might think that that's negligible, but it's nonlinear. So the last few years, last number of years, last couple decades, it's, it's uh, increasing exponentially. So one degree over 100 years is really masking that the change is quite rapid right now. Um, I will be the first to admit, as would most uh, ecologists, geologists, and whatnot, that it's hard to tie any one calamity to any one temperature variation, temperature anomaly, or what have you. But we can look at some things and say, oh, um, there's a pattern going on here. So in 2004 and 2005, two glaciers on Greenland uh, there was a particular 16-month melting period where they lost 400 gigatons of ice. So you ask yourself, wow, how, how much is 400 gigatons of ice? One gigaton is one cubic kilometer. And so in the book, and I think I'm going to get a little bit wrong now, but um, if you were in Manhattan, it would be something like Broadway to Fifth Avenue and Houston Street to 12th Street or something like that. Two Empire State Buildings high. That's one gigaton. We lost 450 of those in a one, roughly a one-year period off Greenland. Now, that's the water that's melting and going into the oceans and raising the, the sea levels that we're all worried about as this temperature change happens. You might think the calamity should have happened in 2004 and 2005. The fact is that generated something like a one-tenth of a millimeter increase in sea level rise. It's a huge amount of water, but Greenland has something like two million gigatons of ice uh, uh, on, its, uh, on, on the land. So it's a long way from doing it. They expect the melt of that to take hundreds of years. And if it does, then we're talking about the 20-foot average sea rise. Um, so 2004 or 5 was a bad year in Greenland. It also happened to be a bad year in Central Europe. They had a six-week period that had a five, <coughs> here we go, uh, a five standard deviation temperature anomaly. 
Now, five standard deviations warmer than the norm is roughly about, if it were calculated on a daily basis, it's about a one in 1.7 million chance of happening. Um, in uh, the odds of seeing it translates into something like once every 5,000 years. And we did it for a six week period in Europe. Uh, we did it, uh, nature did it to us. And in that heat wave, the permafrost on a lot of the high mountain caps uh, melted and there were massive mudslides or landslides down. Depending on who you ask, between 20 and 70,000 Europeans died of heat related uh, injuries. Uh, and that might be what we have coming. We can focus on our own country and Katrina, Sandy, the Texas drought, the Binghamton floods, um, insurance disasters. Uh, their payout is 100 or 800 uh, percent greater than it was in, in 1970. And you could draw this out forever. I could spend the rest of my 20 minutes talking about the calamities and maybe they're related to climate change. Most science thinks it is. If you want to think about what a two-degree change might be. If you just assume some, some normal distribution and um, you know, a mean of zero standard deviation one, two degrees would be that second dotted uh, curve there. And the mean at that time would be in the far tail of what we consider normal today. So just getting to the two degrees it can be a whole lot warmer for us relative to our expectation today. And this is what Copenhagen told us we should shoot for. If we miss it, we're kind of over in that third curve or something like that, and, and we don't know what goes on there. So given that background, I want to demonstrate that the problem is not technological, it's politics. We're political scientists. I assume we're mostly political scientists. Um, so um, if we think about the role of technology and what technology can do, we can dismiss a lot of that as being most central, and I hope to show why. All this... Uh, Low energy lights and those types of things, that's all on the table. You can save 75% of your lighting bill by putting low energy light bulbs in your house, which energy accounts for about, uh, or lights account for about 75% or 7 of your energy bill. So you can just calculate all that stuff out. I did a, I don't know whether you call it experiment, um, but with my students in class uh, earlier this year. I asked them to walk to class when they walk to class during the day because they don't get up when it's dark. Um, and count the number of light bulbs that are on the porch light bulbs that are on in the daytime. And so that weekend I did, I went out for a two mile run in one direction counting the light bulbs, 48 of, uh, uh, 39 of them. I got in the car, drove two miles in the other direction and there were 42 of them or something. And the students came back with roughly the same number of 19 to 20 light bulbs on <clears throat> during the day uh, per mile of <coughs> of residential streets. So we calculated out, <clears throat> making some assumptions about the wattage of light bulbs and how many residential miles there are in the United States. And we came out that one hour of inadvertently left on porch lights would uh, consume the amount of energy from one medium-sized coal-fired plant in the country. So if you just shut all those lights off, <clears throat> one coal plant across the country would go out of service for that particular hour. Now that's behavior and technology because you could put a $20 sensor on the lights and shut it off. <clears throat> um, so the problem itself doesn't seem to be technology, it seems to be politics, and that makes it our problem. <clears throat> uh, it becomes Olson's quintessential collective action problem, uh, and we can think about that, and these are some of the things that I don't think Olson does so well because he's an economist, and of course us enlightened political scientists can do this better. <clears throat> there are multi multiple levels that we have to maximize on in, in uh, 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 achieving a collective good. There's the we, there's the me and you. We're the ones who consume much of the energy. There's the national level, and that's much of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's Congress and, and whatnot. And there's the international level, um, which is the treaty. In Olson's argument, the we would be the hardest to maximize. The Congress would be uh, possible, but some suboptimal level. In a small group the size of, of uh, the collection of countries at Copenhagen, 115 or so, uh, he would argue that you could probably get some outcome that was socially optimal but not uh, perfect, particularly if there was an oligo oligopoly interest involved. <clears throat> okay? So Olson tells us really what the outcome of this should be. Um, 
I think he focuses too little on the firm in the market, to us, really, the we, the first level. So I'm going to change that a little bit. Uh, Olson's logic, I'm not going to go into this because it had to be accessible. And I think the logic of collective action is barely accessible. The key part of Olson's logic, if you break it down, is the value to the individual has got to be greater than the cost that the individual pays. Uh, Todd Sandler, another economist who skips the politics, but he expresses it as an expected utility equation and essentially says the same thing. That if you could think about this as you will take a shorter shower, buy low energy light bulbs, walk instead of drive, whatever, only when you expect to get some positive value out of that, uh, then you won't free ride. Okay? Uh, we know that we defect and most will see uh, selective incentives as critical to finding the way to maximize on this. Okay? I want to argue and maybe show in some ways um, that the selective incentives are political, that we can politically entice or constrain our behavior by providing selective punishments or selective incentives. Okay, uh, these two economists, as good as they are at what they did, they're just not good political scientists. They skip the politics in this, so indulge me for a minute. Um, three things that are not in their models that, that should be. I hope none of you are economists. I mean. He told me this would be all political scientists. I could say whatever I wanted about economists. But okay. Um, three things that, that Olson ignores, by and large. One is the role of uncertainty. One is uh, the discounting of future value, future payoffs. And the third is the multi-level process in which politics plays out. Uh, so I want to talk about each of these um, in turn. So uncertainty, there's a legitimate counter argument out there. I don't necessarily buy it because I think the weight of the evidence sides with anthropogenic causes of, of our climate problems. But maybe it's nature, and people call these the climate denier folks. Um, uh, it might be nature that's doing it. Our science and the geologists and hydrologists and the climate scientists, they also have uncertainty in their models. So science is about uncertainty. Um, so we can't know it's us. We can't know things, for example, is it a local or global maximum? And you always see Climate scientists and climate deniers stretching out the curve to get one more high point in there or something like that. So there's reason to, to say maybe it's not there. We don't know whether our contribution is large or small relative to, to nature's contribution. Now, much of climate science tells us what it is, um, but this place was a whole hell of a lot warmer before we got here. Um, and so nature managed to do it on its own without us. So what I want us to think about is the role of uncertainty. So I'm just going to specify uncertainty as between 0 and 1, some, some uh, estimate of your uncertainty. Second part of this is mitigation is a long way off. Um, most in this room, there's a few of you who might see the payoffs from anything we do today. But I can guarantee you I'll be dead. if. We all cooperated and we all did this. Um, I will be long dead before there's any significant change in the climate dynamics. So I have no reason to do anything but take the long shower, use the incandescent light bulb, drive the big car, whatever it is. Um, so I shouldn't pay the cost of mitigation. And to the extent that I discount that future benefit, which I could discount it completely, um, I have no, no reason to do it. There's also other social and political reasons to discount that future benefit. If you're hungry and you're poor and all you can get is the 1972 Cadillac, you're going to buy the 1972 Cadillac. You're going to discount anything. So it's, it's not all that uh, personal part of it. Um, uh, so we discount the future, and, and I'm just going to specify that as um, your estimate of that future discount ranging between 0 and 1. Um, so. If you buy it up to this point and you take Sandler's argument that we have to just maximize, that before you're going to take any steps, you at the individual level, to mitigate uh, the climate problem, reduce the consumption of CO2 or production of CO2, you got to maximize. And you got to maximize taking into account your understanding of cause and effect, your certainty that you're actually contributing to the problem, and your discounting of that future value. And if P and Q are zero, there's no positive expected value. All you do is pay cost and you get no value out of it. You shouldn't do a damn thing. You should simply go with the flow, do what you're doing, because you don't believe there's any effect out there. 
Now that might be a climate denier, and, and they might legitimately believe that. If it's one, then we're back to just Sandler's expected value issue, Olson's collective action problem, and we have to somehow come up with a way to overcome the collective action problem. There's scads of books and articles on how to overcome the collective action problem. I want to talk about the politics of P&Q. Okay? Um, so costs are a function of technology and behavior. Um, the cost of a sensor to shut off your porch lights, the cost of an incandescent light bulb versus a LED light bulb, something like that. Um, uh, the cost can be manipulated through incentives and mandates. This is, I think, the politics of it. Um, you know, a mandate is a cafe standard, uh, something like that. An incentive might be a rebate on a hybrid car. Uh, uh, who pays the mandates and the incentives is a political issue. These are the things that we know about as political scientists. Um, and the benefits, these aren't about politics. This is about stability of the world, and that's, that's just a human issue, I guess. Um, so we have to think about the conditions under which P and Q are zero or very low and how politics plays out, all right? Uh, level of uncertainty can be manipulated. This is what many would say the climate deniers are doing, and this is really where I want to focus on. Um, maybe it's correct. I, I just don't have a dog in that fight. Um, if science is uncertain, then your level of certainty might not be 1.0, and that might be the right place to be. But uh, if you can make it zero, if you can make it zero politically, then you should take no action on climate change, right? So in 2011, a House committee held hearings to legislate the uncertainty of climate science. So they wanted to make it law. Now, it didn't go anywhere, but the fact that they held a hearing to legislate, they wanted to make it law that P was zero. Hmm, funny. Um, okay. Uh, that would suggest there's significant room for motivated bias in our understanding of certainty and uncertainty. All right? uh, if you're uncertain about cause and effect, then uh, you know, I really, since I'll be dead, I really shouldn't care at all about the future payoff <coughs> in this if I don't think that anything I do causes it. Um, uh, or poor and unemployed, those folks, um, they might have a different way to think about P and Q. <coughs> so we have to ask, who would want to have a a motivated policy to minimize the value of uncertainty and future discount, okay? Uh, so I looked to Congress. I study civil wars. I don't study Congress. I'm, at some point I said, boy, you're going where you shouldn't go. Just don't get in other people's business here. You know, you, you can't do this. Stick with civil wars. But um, legislation can overcome, uh, can pay that selective benefit that, that we need. Legislation is the tool that implements treaties. Copenhagen could specify that the United States had to reduce emissions by X amount, and there's no enforcement in that treaty. There's nothing to get you to reduce it. National level legislation has to come on and mandate that change. Okay? Um, so I thought, well, who would be the people that would have the most incentive in having uh, um, less restrictive policy with regard to, to uh, climate issues. Um, and it's jobs and things like that. Uh, if you have jobs in certain industries and you restrict the consumption of those products, you at least have a short-term problem. Because at the congressional level, you, of course, have to um, uh, get elected every year. So I hypothesized that the number of jobs in certain industries would predict to the vote. You've got to remember, the vote was a close one. He had a, uh, the president's party had a 75-seat majority in the House. He won by seven seats. So there's a lot of crossover, a lot of Democrats defecting from it. Um, so I looked at three industries, the oil, the coal, and the auto industry. I used NAICS codes to get employment in those industries. I uh, used GIS and the FIPS codes to overlap. The, the employment data is at the county level. I overlapped congressional district data um, with county level data using, using GIS, and I got effectively the number of votes in a congressional district tied to jobs in those three uh, standard classifications. There's double counting. Somebody's going to say, you double counted because county level employment will overlap congressional districts. And I did double count, and I think it's okay that I double counted. Because if the same people are in two different congressional districts, both Congress people would be concerned, okay? So, 
<coughs> I ran a simple model. Uh, I have the results for it, but I just regressed the vote, yes, no, on jobs and party affiliation. So uh, if you want to see the results, I have them later, but I, don't, I think that violates the accessibility issue. Uh, if you just took the baseline of a Democratic uh, congressperson, low jobs in these industries, there's a 90% chance that that person, that congressperson, would vote uh, for the bill. If you then just add uh, jobs into that baseline, if you get to a baseline where you have a Democratic congressperson, the president's party just won the election, all, everybody's all jacked up about this you know, huge majority stuff, uh, that congressperson's probability of voting with the president's initiative drops by 51%. Okay. Um, some part of that explanation's got to be in the jobs. Um, is, and the jobs becomes, whoa, um, becomes a, a way to think about motivated bias. Is that clear enough that you can see it? Is I, yeah, it's kind of hazy there. But here's what I did. A, a congressional vote doesn't tell us a darn thing about Senate ratification. The treaty never came to the Senate. So I wanted to get some purchase on what the Senate ratification prospects were by looking at House votes on a bill. So I just made a, a number of assumptions about, given the vote at a congressional district, what are the odds that the senators for that district voted, would vote for ratification of a treaty? You got to keep in mind, this was an 18% reduction. The treaty would have been a 50%. So this is a very muted version of what Copenhagen was trying to do. So the first. Uh, first one, if, and it says uh, states vote assuming homogeneity with net district votes. That means if, if a state level congressional district was a net nay vote, the senators voted against a hypothetical treaty. This is all counterfactual. This never happened. It never will happen. I'm just playing with data to get a sense of the possibility. Okay? So if the states just voted with their congressional district, which is a, a pretty huge assumption that senators would just vote with the net of their congressional district. The treaty fails by 22 votes. Huge. Um, <clears throat> the second one is assuming that 50% of the nay votes at the first level, they just change their vote to, to a yes vote. So in the congressional district, in the state where congressional district votes, uh, the net vote is against the 24-54. One of the senators in that state bolts and sides with the president to, to ratify it. Again, a very huge assumption that that would happen. Their ratification would have made it by four votes. It took nearly all of those. Uh, that huge assumption took most all of it to get a possible uh, passage uh, or ratification of a treaty. And then I just go through, I go through more in the book, but I just go through various combinations of assumptions to think about the distribution of votes at the congressional level and how they possibly would map to uh, the distribution of votes in a Senate ratification. And as you can see, it always fails by 20 odd votes. Uh, and it, only with this huge assumption of number two that I was trying to find the, the most fanciful assumption I could make, and there it passes by four votes. And almost, I think it's never, I think only in that one assumption would it even pass as a Senate equivalent of the House bill. So it's almost impossible to see this even being national legislation, let alone the, the higher bar of treaty ratification. Okay? Uh, and I'm, I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, <clears throat> One of my questions is the implications for ratification. If we have to satisfy some multi-level game and uh, achieve a, 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 a social good at three levels, well, one of the things we have to think about is how would you ever get something like this ratified um, uh, given that there are motivated biases. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that Congress telegraphed the inability, if I could do this and I study civil wars, I mean, this was, I had to ask somebody how you get congressional voting data. Um, so if I could do this and I study civil wars, then Congress telegraphed to everybody else at Copenhagen that we'd never ratify that treaty. And if you go back, Obama kind of dashed over there, we're going to have the treaty, and then he had some <coughs> meetings with the Chinese. And I could see the Chinese guy saying, you're, just, you're not going to pass this thing. You've got to be kidding me. Um, and having a very difficult time negotiating a treaty because 
I'm going to guess that President Obama was involved in the signaling process about uh, our interest in climate change. The uh, second implication is that the, the votes on that bill had a plausible link to, to a motivated bias. One of the things folks uh, advocating for climate change legislation have to deal with is what's a strategy that can get this type of legislation, these constraints, through Congress? Well, this analysis would suggest that uh, you have to deal with the private interest of the elected officials in states that pay a higher cost. Um, if you're in, I don't know, Rhode Island, you might not pay a very high cost and you just get a very large benefit from siding with something like this. But if you're in Detroit or you're in Louisiana, you're going to have to have something on the table that allow you to, to overcome that, that personal interest in, in um, in, in uh, passing such legislation. Uh, a third thing is it's easy to manipulate uncertainty and, and your future discount, right? And um, at the end of the day, it's you and me that have to take action to minimize the climate pressures, either by pressuring our elected officials or changing our behavior, whatever it is. Um, but it's really easy to discount the, the future payoff for this. I mean, it's remarkably easy. And if you just think for a minute, you'll be dead by the time anything happens, like me, it's, it's almost a no-brainer. It seems pretty rational. You have to think about somebody other than you as the beneficiary of what you're doing. And um, it's a pretty remarkable problem. <coughs> and in the book, I talk about other problems like this, and few actually raise it to this level um, of difficulty of, of doing this. Uh, some broader in implications. If you're interested in climate change, you better buckle down because this can be a hard one. Um, it's not like ozone. It's not like saving the whales. This is real, really different. One of the differences, for example, between ozone and the CO2 problem, ozone's a chemical product. It's, you don't find it on the CFCs and whatnot. You don't find them on the periodic table. The CO2 problem, you find carbon and oxygen on the periodic table. The production of that is just us doing what we do. You know, we're, we're creating it here as we do this. But the ozone problem was created in factories. So it could be fixed in factories. Um, CO2 has got to be fixed somewhere other than in the factories. All the factories matter. Um, we have to think about, uh, from a political science point of view, we have to think about multi-levels and maximizing a collective good at multi-levels of interaction. I just don't see how we can do that otherwise. We're fooling ourselves if you were trying to cook up a strategy to do this, to think you could all do it just by the United States, when we know we can't. We have to have lots of other people on board, and that's both the activists, the consumer, the legislature, and international partners. Um, and uh, the thing I walk away with is we can manipulate all this. If you wanted to be devious, this is what you manipulate. I mean, it just seems to me it's a really easy one. On a really big problem, you could really manipulate this. And there's lots of books that simply, um, uh, they deny the science behind uh, climate change. And if you read them, what they really deny is that it's the, the bulk of the problem is driven by humans. That's a debatable issue. The IPCC and other groups all come out and say, it really is us. But it's really easy to put doubt in your head. And if all it takes is a little bit of doubt in your head that you can't maximize, well, uh, if it's not us, then anything I do is a waste of my time. Um, uh, uh, I think that um, if you're out to generate a stable climate, um, which I think we should, then you ought to really think hard about a strategy for doing it. Because business as usual, we're probably going to lose. Um, and uh, we might be in for one hell of a ride. Yes, um, that's it. How'd I do? But, um, uh, you know, I, I really don't have a clue, but it's a great question I've never thought of. 
Um, whew. All right. Uh, you got that out of the way. Yeah, you got that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to guess it's something, uh, you know, and I'm not a scholar of comparative politics or European politics, but I'd have to say it's something in their political dynamics that, that um, we do differently. But, yeah. I don't know either. Will the next question please be easier? <laughs> An easy question about uh, climate change and law. <laughs> okay, so there are any of those. So, when you, so how do you get from how do you get from civil wars to this? I mean, is this completely independent, or is there something you saw in the study of civil wars that reminded you of the conflict maybe within the U.S.? Yeah, um, another good question. One, there's um, a growing, but not very robust body of literature, um, and there's a lot of uh, folk wisdom that says as we cook the planet, one of the social consequences could be a lot more armed conflict out there. And there was a recent science article, uh, probably a year ago, that was really, really definitive. If you increase the average temperature by one degree, you increase the number of rapes, gang violence, uh, social violence, short of war, and armed conflict by very defined amounts. But it's the only piece that really can come up with that conclusion. So, uh, you know, my initial interest was what do we know about climate science that will drive some social behavior of armed conflict? Um, and I stumbled across, well, how do I explain this one to my students that we came back with nothing from Copenhagen? Um, uh, I still think, and now I do some work in climate science and conflict, uh, I think the, the difficulty of, of not being able to adequately articulate a, a strong relationship between climate pressures and conflict is our modeling is so fundamentally out of whack with climate science modeling in terms of scale, in terms of uh, geographic scale, time scale, um, the causal processes. We have a lot of work to do in that area. Um, and you know, there's not that many people doing it, so it's a great open area for research. You know, in, in thinking about this in, in terms of politics, there's a fellow, an Australian guy, Jeffrey Haynes Styles, and he did a documentary two or three years ago called Earth, the Operator's Manual. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's about an hour long. I guess there's two of them. But the interesting perspective is the host was both a geologist and a dedicated Republican. Yeah. Okay, so that was, you know, using himself and talking about how climate change is important for his values. Yep. And then the first vignette they did is they went, I think it was to the Air Force, they talked to major people in the Air Force. They said, within our organization, which is politically quite you know, conservative, mm -hmm. they said, there's really not a debate about climate change because our operations depend on it. We've been looking at the data. And this isn't debatable here. We have already adapted. And if you think about it, I mean, the main thing that climate does in terms of us is it changes where water is, mm -hmm. right? We Absolutely. build most of our civilizations around assumptions about where water is. Yep. You build cities and you can drink it, you can plant. And where it isn't, so you can put up things like that. Yep. What climate change does it is, is so for the, for the Air Force, for example, or the military, you know, if you're going to uh, go into a certain place, yeah, if it's possible, you have to build supply lines. You have to build water, everything, you have to do that. And if you're making the wrong assumptions about where water is or, or things you're going to drink or so forth, that puts your troops at risk. Is that, so that's that's you know uh, that's a way that sort of government's progressing, but there they have an operation imperative that are putting the partisan. Yeah, actually, uh, the military, in many ways, is some of the most enlightened folks on the security consequences of climate change. And there's a 160-page DoD report that um, forecast that 600,000 square kilometers of currently arable land in Africa will go offline by 2060, I believe. So if you think about that, it's a swath of land 250 odd miles wide right across the United States that's currently being farmed, it's gonna go offline. They're worried from a security point of view. Uh, but Congress doesn't seem to get it. So it's not the whole government, it's, it's the politics of it. Future 
sort of the objective knowledge and assessment provided by the scientific community with regard to state of climate change. First question. Mm -hmm. Second one is okay, global politics of climate change with this uh, complex of uh, multilateral governance. And do you think the current or IR theories can supply sufficient tools to explain this complexity? Do we need sort of new tools or terms or notions to explain we as a political scientists? Do we need uh, some kind of a toolbox to explain the complexity of the climate exchange politics? Um, the first one, and I think these might be linked, um, the international uh, IPCC, international something on climate change, uh, the P I'm missing right now. What? Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, they're reasonably definitive in what the science tells us. Now, what they do do, and it's just good science, I think, um, they present models that are different models by different research teams that make different sets of assumptions, general circulation models, they call them. And uh, they tend to use four models, but the four models might make quite different predictions in terms of the average temperature or ocean temperature or whatever they're modeling. Um, and they might range from 2 degrees to 12 degrees. So there's uncertainty just in what those models present. And what then they do is say that we, we agree with high certainty, low certainty, moderate certainty, um, that anthropogenic emissions of CO2 are causing some range of this. So um, you know, the difficulty for the consumer, and I think the problem is at the consumer level, not the science level, um, is they look like they're all over the map. But just like they look like they're all over the map, if you have some model of congressional voting behavior and the coefficients are different between two different studies and the standard errors are different, you might say, phew, you know, we don't know anything about voting behavior. The fact is, we kind of do. Um, so I think it's somehow in a translation from the climate science stuff that has to reduce the complexity that the consumer sees. And that might be a congressional problem also, that the elected official simply can't articulate the right answer to a, a constituent. So. Um, the, the debate now uh, has shifted in many ways from mitigating or reducing the emissions to adapting. And a lot of the adapter first type people, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, really have just worked from the premise that we're facing it. And this is really what the UN came out last week and said. Um, you know, we just have to suck up and accept the fact that climate change here is going to be pretty dramatic, and so let's adapt. One of the differences, the key differences, I think, between a policy of adaptation and a policy of mitigation is adaptation is really a, a game for the wealthy countries. Um, the poor can adapt unless the wealthy pay them. So we can skip the mitigation because we can afford to adapt. We adapt and keep, keep spewing the stuff out there, and then the harm goes to the countries that can't. And it's also, in terms of solving the problem, you know, some of it's local. It's at the, the city level. Um, uh, Katrina, and that's it's Louisiana, or New Orleans doing some of it, the state of Louisiana doing some of it, the federal government doing some of it. Um, but it's a different collective action problem, I guess. My worry about the adaptation first approach to that is it's just a wealthy person's game. So we all adapt and we say we're fine as the rest of the world you know, cooks. Um, bad outcome. I'll get you. Oh, hi. So, Lee Raymond from the University. Um, I very much agree with you about this being a classic like that problem. That's how 
how I teach this to my students. I wonder how you respond, though, to the question that a lot of these like measure problems aren't just relying on kind of uncertainty about damages, right? So Gary Harvard famously followed the lessons to steps, vice versa, point out that actually in case it's perfectly rational to continue to ruin a resource because you can't trust anybody else to restrain themselves from ruining that resource, right? That's another classic way of thinking about that problem. Pretty way to think about climate right? So I think you can make a pretty good argument that it's not so much uncertainty about the risk as it is unwillingness or un inability to trust that other people will contribute some share to the solution. And if we reduce our emissions, right, by 1%, that will have no effect unless other people do likewise. Your models seem to focus a lot on promoting uncertainty or having a, or a discount of future benefits and not so much on the model that I think might be more at least equally plausible, which is that we're fairly confident that there's a real problem, but nobody wants it. One thing you don't want to be doing is being the only actor who's trying to solve the problem, right? Because then you're actually more solved. So I wonder if that, if you have any thoughts about how that model might fit in think it was wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, and I'll just say Olson is, seems to be absolutely right, that we'd all shirk, we'd all defect, given uh, you know, free will and cost-benefit maximization, that we have no incentive to really do anything. But um, policymakers, uh, if the individual at, at one level says, I'm not doing it until nobody else does, that doesn't absolve an enlightened policy community from observing the harm that's coming and use, uh, using enticements or coercion to get us to do what we need to do. Some form of selective payout to the individual. Um, so at one level, I, I don't see it as, um, uh, you know, the primary political issue is not at the level of the individual that I agree with you. I might as well take my long shower because the amount that I contribute is so small. And since I know you're gonna take one if I don't, then I don't have any interest in, in restraining my behavior. Um, you know, I just say that enlightened policy, that's why we hire these people, uh, if they see the problem coming and the government agencies that we hire and we pay to find out whether the doom is coming, all seem to say the doom is coming, um, maybe they should just listen to them and force us to not be Olson's quintessential collective actor, actors. Yeah. Uh, so. We have time for uh, one last question, please. <laughs> yeah. This poor gentleman up here is going to be mad at you, but no, go ahead. <laughs> I think you have the mic off or something. I can't hear you. Climate change events are uh, washed out by the news <coughs> agency. Is barely weather for this. Uh, you know, uh, Katrina and uh, Sandy are, well, an unfortunate weather event. Uh, yep. And uh, do you think that the possibly the government could come up with criteria that would enable or even require the news, news agencies to report these things correctly? Um, I, I don't want to put the blame on the news feed or anybody, but we do have to make a distinction between weather and climate, and those two are very different. Um, and a lot of the studies on climate and conflict really focus on weather and conflict. So it's bad weather, but bad weather doesn't necessarily uh, describe a climate change in that sense. Um, so. Uh, you know, you have to look for a pattern that these bad weather events are systematic related, systematically related to other geophysical processes that would be described by climate change. I think that uh, climate science does that quite admirably, to be truthful. So I don't know that the media is just portraying it incorrectly. Can I get you to take one more? Yeah, sure. Yes. Right. I, yeah. Hi, I'm Mel Cohen from uh, Miami University in Ohio, where we don't worry about hurricanes. <laughs> Okay. Um, but trying to get back to the politics of it, not simply the science, uh, should we be looking for a Republican presidential candidate that believes in climate change? Yeah. Um, talk about another question outside my pay grade. Um, uh, 
I had this discussion the other somebody asked me, so are we ever going to fix this? And I, my response was it might take a Republican president to come in and, uh, you know, like Nixon going to China, that type of thing. I don't really know the answer to that. That's kind of crystal balling it. But something's got to overcome the individual incentive to defect at the congressional level. Um, it could, you know, might be a lot of things uh, uh, federally or, or uh, funded campaigns. You know, we're going the other way. But if you didn't have to worry about money, then you might not have to worry about these types of things also. You know, for what it's worth, there's uh, Bob Inglis, who's a former South Carolina member of the House, has put together a conservative climate change institute. Yeah, Douglas Holtz Eakin is involved in other people. And so they're trying to find, you know, within the conser conservative mm. kind of language, ideas for mm -hmm. this. The thing they're floating, which is interesting, is this carbon tax swap, mm -hmm. right? So the idea is you implement a carbon tax, but you use it to substitute for income tax. And so it's interesting, right, because in some sense you're taking the uncertainty of climate out of it, but you're asking people to make a trade-off, would you rather tax work, or would you rather tax carbon at that level? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So. All right, what I'd like to do is, is thank Professor Regan. This is really a wonderful topic. <laughs> thank you for coming here. If this is the type of thing that you'd like to see the Midwest Political Science Association doing more of, uh, please uh, contact the association, contact me, let us know, because, you know, really, this is trying to provide value for you and opportunities for you, you know, to think about things, to experience new things, and, and to really you know, try and make your time here valuable. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Yeah, and enjoy cool. our Great. Thank you.